Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, how blessed we are today to celebrate Christ's amazing gift to us, the gift of His Spirit. Gives joy to the bride of Christ that the third person of the Trinity was given to us to make us by true faith share in Christ and all His benefits. He was sent to comfort us to remain with us forever, to practically fulfill Christ's promise in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But beloved, as we celebrate His gifts on this Pentecost day in 2016, we need to remind ourselves of the deeper reason and the purpose of this outpouring. Pentecost can never be Remembered as a mere fact. And the Spirit is not, not only given to us to equip, to equip us with a few spiritual gifts as described in 1 Corinthians 12 and Galatians 5. For us, beloved, to appreciate the deeper meaning of Pentecost, we are this morning placed next to our Old Testament brothers and sisters whom the prophet to whom the prophet Ezekiel prophesied. A servant of the Lord, taken in exile to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar in 597 BC, Ezekiel receives several visions from God. He was probably about 30 years old, living in a small town just north of Baghdad in the current Iraq. And in chapter 1 to 24, Ezekiel describes God's perspective on the time before the exile and his judgment on his unfaithful people. And then follows a description of God's judgment on the heathen nations, chapter 25 to 32. And Ezekiel closes by describing the time of salvation awaiting the faithful remnants of Israel, in chapter 33 to 48. And part of that Amazing news of God's promise is the renewal through His Spirit. Ezekiel doesn't only describe the coming of the ultimate shepherd in chapter 34 to save and restore the Old Testament church, to bring her into the New Testament covenant. No, also the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of His people is included in this prophecy. God not only wants to cleanse His people and renew their hearts towards obedience, but He does so, says verse 22, for His namesake. That is what Ezekiel wants to move forward with, that he wants to put up front. That's the deeper motive for sending His Spirit into the hearts of His people. For His name's sake. So in order for us, beloved, to enjoy a true Pentecost celebration today, we have to see that deeper meaning of Pentecost. For it's not first of all our sake, but for the sake of the name of the Lord, that Christ poured out His Spirit, says Ezekiel. And that's also what we hear in Peter's sermon on Pentecost. It is not a good feel pep talk, but a powerful call to repentance and renewal of heart and life for God's name's sake. And so for us, our Pentecost celebration should result in a, in a closer and a deeper connected life to Christ, for His name is holy. So I preach you the good news of Pentecost under the theme for the sake of Christ's name, celebrating Pentecost according to God's promise through Ezekiel means, first of all, cleansing with water, second, regeneration of hearts, and third, a new life of obedience through the Spirit. For the sake of God's name, celebrating Pentecost according to God's promise through Ezekiel means, in the first place, cleansing with water. Beloved, in the world that we live in, 
the reason for misbehavior is not often sought in sinful men. But in unfortunate accumulating circumstances. And then all sorts of therapeutical solutions are sought to, to deal with the symptoms of it. You probably know the old song, What Shall We Do With a Drunken Sailor? And the method of bringing about behavioral change in this alcoholic is, as the song goes, to drag him under the longboat until he is sober. Or put him on the scuppers and hose him all over. Beloved, as, as if these methods will result in lasting life changes in the drunken sailor's life. And to deal with those in society who lost the road, indeed all sorts of programs are worked out. And many hours and many dollars are spent to deal with the symptoms of dysfunctional people. And beloved, don't take me wrong. When people have clinical disorders or fall into certain addictions, they struggle to escape, professional help is needed. But dealing with sinful people is not in the first place a matter of helping them to make lifestyle choices that result in, in better quality of life. It's not only about resolving their behavioral problem by finding and fixing it with psychological expertise. In contrast to this humanistic care model for human predicament, Ezekiel has presented the Lord's diagnosis of a misbehavioral attitude. And especially for that of his own people, Israel. Israel is not like a drunken sailor that needs some treatment. Israel is not so much sick and in need of a cure. She is sinful and in need of purification. Now, through her past history of sin, she has made herself totally unfit to inhabit God's land and to live and worship before His face. And because of her sin, she lived an offensive life before a holy God. She was by nature an object of God's wrath, says Ephesians 2 verse 3. Her lifestyle changes is necessary not so much because she fell into idolatry addiction and therefore is missing out on, a, on a, a living a full life, but because she has, by her disobedience and rebellion, forfeited the right to live its, to life itself. God's judgment has descended on her and she has been scattered among the nations. That is the Lord's diagnosis and, and treatment for misbehavior attitude. This, this raises then the question, beloved, is change then possible with God's people? And if yes, how is change then possible? Is the assumed infinite power of the human spirit, often suggested in social media, like Facebook and Instagram, like you can kick the habit or lose those pounds or win friends or influence people. Is that the solution? Is humanistic optimism, often carried over also into the church, a way to go? Is a God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, motivation, is that the way to go with a sinner? Is that the most natural and self-evident truth in the world? Many think so. And that's why many approach Christianity or the church as seeking to determine if maybe that will work for them. Assuming that God will, will only be too pleased to welcome them because they chose for Him. Beloved Ezekiel, in Ezekiel and from Ezekiel we get a completely different answer. Because of God's determination from the beginning, 
to complete his plan of redemption, he wanted sinners to be saved. Also his people Israel. And not only be saved, but also be sanctified. They need to be clenched. They need to be sanctified to stand in His holy presence. And that counts for every sinner. But most of all for God's people. And that is exactly what Peter also called to his audience on that Pentecost day in Acts 2. For them to do. After the lengthy explanation on who Jesus of Nazareth really was, what He did, and how they have to understand His crucifixion, and also their guilt in judging, condemning, and hanging the Son of God on a wooden cross, and they, in shock and afraid of God's wrath, ask, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered, Repent, and let Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's the power of, God, of Pentecost. That's God's solution for a misbehavior attitude. They need the water of baptism to be clenched. They need purification by Christ. For no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of spirit. We read in John 3 verse 5. And beloved, because we are by nature not better than a druggie or an alcoholic, we as God's new covenant people also need to be purified from our sins. That's why we need the spirit of Pentecost. We need clean water just as God's people in our text. We too need purification, which corresponds to the outward sprinkling of water on the restored Israel, according to our text. And in this work, we are the passive recipients of God's action of washing away our sins. God is applying the merits of Christ's work on the cross on us. That is what our baptism points to. When we are baptized, whether as adults or children, we testify that we need Christ, whose, whose cleansing blood is symbolized in the water of baptism. Baptism points to the need for change that can only come from outside, from someone else. And therefore the sprinkling of clean water Ezekiel is speaking about points to the baptism as an act of faith in God's promises. So when we baptize our children, we know that a baptism of the heart, a new birth through the Holy Spirit, is necessary. Just simply applying water on the baby's head will not save him or her. No, every baby needs the Spirit of Pentecost. Every believer needs the Spirit of Pentecost. God needs to work that in us and our children. And so Pentecost reminds us of our covenant God's faithfulness towards us and our families. And that's why Peter in verse 39 adds to his call of repentance, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. God's promise of clenching, sprinkling with clean water. Brothers and sisters, for God's people in exile, Ezekiel's promise of clean, sprinkled water must have been amazing. It meant that the exile is not the end. Because of God's holy name, they will return to Jerusalem and to the promised land, verse 24. But more than that, God will purify them. The washing in the copper basin wash basin in the temple which they had neglected for so many years will be applied to them in an even more powerful spiritual way. God will wash them and take away their sins and renew their lives. And in verse 25b, God says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness 
and from all your idols. Is that not also what we receive in Christ and celebrate today, brothers and sisters? As one commentary puts it, thus God's wonderful plan for our lives is not limited to taking us to heaven. It also includes bringing heaven into us, remaking us into holy people. But the Lord is not just happy to wash us from our past sins. He also imputes to us the righteousness of His Son towards working perfect holiness in us through His Spirit. Yes, He wants complete regeneration of our hearts. And that's our second point, regeneration of hearts. Brothers and sisters, our hearts and souls, as you know, are the seeds of our thoughts and will. From there, our actions flow and are steered. And to continue His purifying work in His people, God then needs to work on our inside. By nature, we nurture hearts of stone. A heart of stone is a cold and a deaf and insensitive heart. There's no life in it. But God steps in and changes the seeds of thoughts and will by replacing unresponsive, unyielding hearts of stone with warm, living, responsive hearts of flesh. A heart that, that beats with faithful compassion and love for the Lord. And as you know, this renewal of hearts is a lifelong process through which the Lord changes us. Or like Lord Say 33 describes it, it is the dying of the old nature and the coming of life of the new. When God changes our hearts from stone to flesh, it means it is a grief, our grief with heartfelt sorrow that we have offended God by our sin and more and more to hate it and flee from it. But it's also a heartfelt joy in God through Christ and a love and a delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. Quoting from the Catechism. And this, this is an ongoing process in your and my life. Again, for the initial readers of Ezekiel, this must have been an unbelievable element of God's promise. Yes, the Old Testament saints also experienced the renewing work of the Spirit in God, of God in their lives. Psalm 51, verse 10 to 11. But in their experience, the work of renewal of their hearts was always partial, always provisional. The Spirit was not poured out yet. It was like a tap just dripping. But what Ezekiel thus prophesied to them was now a mind-blowing act of God. And beloved, it indeed was. Look at the responses. When we see the fulfilling of this promise taking place at Pentecost, look at the response of the people on Pentecost in Jerusalem. So many wonders, wind, tongues of fire, speaking and hearing wonder, and Peter's powerful sermon. And then we read in verse 37, Therefore they were cut to the heart. God was doing what He promised in Ezekiel, converting their stone hearts to flesh hearts. Forty days ago, many of them were yelling, Crucify this man! And now the unimaginable happened. Hearts are brought to repentance. And the cleansing water of baptism flows on the heads of old and young. And now that Christ has died and risen, the Spirit of God has been given to us too in full measure. Now we may too put to death the misdeeds of our body, Romans 8 verse 13. Or rather, God continues to work that in us. So that we respond with hearts of flesh, to his word. And that is also emphasized here that 
It is not our work. It is the Lord doing this. I cause it to happen, says the Lord. The Lord works that life-renewing miracle in us. It's the power of God, so to speak, that flows over in us so that we can become one with His Son. He empowers us to do good works by putting His Spirit within us. And thus, a new life is possible also in our days. That's also part of Ezekiel's prophecy to God's sinful people. A new life of obedience through the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, God's Spirit is in us. That is a source of new life in this world. Also for us. What is the effect? Well, Ezekiel says, walking in God's statutes and keeping and doing God's judgment. Isn't that just amazing? Isn't that a sign of God's grace? For the very reason God's people went into exile, namely the profaning of God's name among the nations, defiling God's land by their own ways of deeds, and continue to do so while they are in exile, so unclean that, that God compares it with the uncleanness of the woman in her customary impurity, verse 17, reflecting on Leviticus 15, verse 19. That whole filthy life of God's people, He will change in His grace. And so He does with us. How? By putting His Spirit within them, says verse 27. Only then, God's people would be fit to live in the presence of the Holy One and commune with Him. God will not merely bring His people back, to, back physically to the land of promise, but also cause a total change of their nature. He will pour out His Spirit on them. And the Spirit, which brings life and power, will indwell them and create in them both the will and the ability to follow God's decrees and laws. And then finally, they will be fit to live in God's land and be His people. And He in turn will not be ashamed to be called their God, says verse 28. And God did this. He fulfilled all this in this promise of, at Pentecost. For those who came to Christ, those 3,000 new church members on that one day were changed by the Spirit who was given to them. They received the Spirit according to Peter's words in verse 38b. And we saw the effect. What happened? Verse 32 says, 42 says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They were, so to speak, the faithful ones that God gave a new place in His land. Or to put it in New Testament terms, He brought them back from darkness into the light of Christ. They inherited a heavenly temple, Jesus Christ. They received the promise of new obedience worked in them, in that they become concerned for God's holy name. And beloved, because we are grafted into them through faith in Christ, Paul says in Romans 11 verse 17, God also works in us the obedience for His name's sake. As a church of the new covenant after Pentecost, concern for God's name is our central focus. Don't we often pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name? Sure we do. And that's the purpose, that's the focus in our lives. God's holy name. That's why God gave His Spirit in our hearts. And since Pentecost, God placed His trying name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on our heads. No, there's no longer a temple on which God connects His divine name. 
and where the divine presence is experienced there in Jerusalem? No, after Pentecost, we know that whenever two or more are gathered in the name of Christ, there they may experience His presence. There His holy name is in our midst. That is what the people in Acts 2 experienced after Pentecost. Resulting in them, first of all, the praising of God's name. Acts 2 verse 47. Variation from Ezekiel, we have learned that Pentecost is about God's exclusive concern with His holy name and glory. And therefore He changes people. Therefore, He puts His Spirit in their hearts. Now, to contemporary readers, this may seem as if God is offensively self-absorbed by His name. However, we worship God's name because of who God is for us in Christ. But God is only for us because it brings glory to Himself. Such self-absorption is, is as great a virtue in God as it is a flaw in human beings, says one commentary. For God is to delight. For God to delight in His own perfections is entirely appropriate. Since there is no one and nothing greater in which He can delight. For God to delight in anything less than His own name and himself would be idolatry. Just as surely as it is idolatry for us to light in anything less than our trying God. And that's why God brought his people out of exile into, this, into the land. For God's people in exile to whom Ezekiel had to prophesy, it was something they so desperately need to discover or to rather receive. To be filled with the promise of Pentecost. To have changed heart to put God's name first. And so He does that with us. We may rejoice in the powerful working of the Spirit, applying the cleansing blood of Christ to our lives. And continuously regenerating our hearts and turning it to obedience for the name, for the sake of God's name. Beloved, my Pentecost 2016 reminds us that we live for His name. And that we are, although we are and remain sinners all our days. We are at the same time justified sinners. Justified sinners who will one day certainly be glorified sinners. Perfect in holiness through His Spirit for His name's sake. Let us sing that. To new life, let us be raised. Holy Spirit, you be praised. Amen.